was turning over um, to Felicia Kilgore because first of all, I think everyone should have a good understanding of what is it that the city can do? How can the city help? And so um, Felicia is the director of our community development program. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Tina really got me on a, a time crunch this morning. So um, I may have to go through some information a little bit more quicker uh, than I anticipate, but um, we're going to do uh, the best that we can. Just keep in mind, it is a little bit more high level, so we will provide our contact information just in case you'd like to have a more in-depth conversation one-on-one -on -one, um, as we move forward and as, as we continue to explore. Uh, opportunities. Okay, so I'm Felicia Kilgore. I'm the uh, Director of Community Development. Uh, we're located at 1401 Main Street on the fourth floor. City of Columbia, uh, Community Development. What we do, uh, we administer federal programs. Uh, so we receive funds directly from HUD uh, that we utilize those dollars to uh, invest in affordable housing, whether it be single family or multifamily. Um, so we utilize what we refer to as home, home funds. Um, that's kind of like the acronym, but it's actually called um, Home Investment Partnership Program, which is, um, like I mentioned, a program through HUD that we administer. Uh, we work with nonprofit and for-profit organizations to, again, develop uh, new affordable housing, single family homes for home ownership and for rental. Keep in mind that all of our federal programs are uh, catered towards low to moderate income individuals and families. I'm on. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, um, when we generally put funds out on the street um, for development, we like to concentrate King, Lion Street, Martin Luther King, Edna Stowe, Booker Washington, uh, and I know Tony is actually doing some work in Booker Washington as well. Uh, the neighborhood revitalization, which kind of um, incorporate Eau Claire and some other areas uh, to fill in the entire Eau Claire area. Pinehurst, Belvedere, and Brandon Acres. Cedar Terrace. So those are our nine communities, uh, nine areas that we try to focus our dollars in to um, help redevelop those areas and improve those areas. So these are just uh, some of our housing goals that we have in place. Um, we want to ensure that our dollars are definitely increasing um, and making decent, safe, affordable housing for the citizens of Columbia. We definitely want to ensure that we revitalize the neighborhoods to improve the quality of life uh, for the residents, uh, provide financial assistance to prevent homelessness, uh, and provide housing and supportive services to the homeless as well. So with these new projects that we endeavor in with our for-profit or non-profit organization, we want to create jobs, um, improve and stimulate the economy. Provide permanent housing for persons suffering uh, with HIV or AIDS. And provide financial assistance to prevent homelessness for persons living with HIV and AIDS. And of course, provide quality services, uh, support services for those individuals that's living and maintaining those homes for housing stability. Here recently, I don't know if you actually got the notification that we actually put on the streets, $3.5 million um, that we want to encourage uh, applications for um, new units, new affordable units. We uh, had a workshop, I guess in September, September 20th, 20th I think was the date that we had that workshop on uh, outlining how we want those funds to be structured, um, how they are to be utilized. But of course, again, it was for affordable housing or either um, home ownership or for rental. So, so what does that mean in layman's terms? In layman's terms, what that means, the $3.5 million is funds that the city has uh, to invest in your projects. Um, a lot of times, and of course, there's an application process uh, that you have to complete all supported documents you have to uh, turn in what the plans are, how you are to utilize those dollars, 
particularly on the city's portion, how you'll be utilizing the city's funds as you request a portion of the 3.5 million that we had um, put out there to utilize. That's kind of high level again. Um, if you want more information, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be more than more than happy to uh, go over what that looks like. I feel like I'm being rushed, you know. <laughs> I got time to look at wonderful. So um, when we put the 3.5 out, those are if you notice the I can tell me this guy. So these are the eligible projects that we want to ensure that we invest in. It. New construction for affordable housing rental units, so that can be multifamily, uh, just as the mayor said, townhomes. Um, and then also rehabilitation of affordable rental units as well. Uh, if you have units that uh, you maintain and have uh, uh, had in place for a number of years, as long as there's no federal funds that was invested in those properties and you're out of your affordability period, you could request additional dollars from us to rehabilitate those units, okay, to improve them. And then, of course, single-family um, uh, homes uh, for home ownership. <coughs> so again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, these funds are catered towards um, folks that fall within the low to moderate income. And kind of what that low to moderate income looks like for a single person, um, that's, uh, where their income does not exceed forty-seven thousand five hundred dollars, they are considered low to moderate incomes. And can you say that one more time? That. Yeah. So for a single person living or occupying one of these units uh, that is supported by federal dollars. Uh, a low to moderate income looks like, as a single person that is, uh, their income cannot exceed $47,500 as a single person. Now, as your family grows, the income level, um, the maximum income level does increase. Unfortunately, I don't have that uh, right at the top of my head, but it does increase this as your family grows. It'll give you a little bit more flexibility in terms of the income. Okay, so um, again, you know, with we, we try to work with, of course, nonprofits. And as a matter of fact, the application that we receive for these funds are nonprofit organizations, and we also work with for-profit organizations <coughs> as well. Um, we uh, we do have um, some um, some work relationship now with for-profit organizations. That's a little bit more on a higher level that we are currently working with these organizations and we, um, um, the city itself is working with those. So there, we don't have federal dollars in those for our projects. So these are larger, larger, multi-family, live tech um, projects that are in the works that we also work with as well. But federal dollars, federal dollars. Uh, we generally like to support our nonprofits. Uh, if you notice that, um, you know, we, when we um, extend funds to support their projects, we do look at in terms of how much they can um, afford or um, support a loan. Uh, we look at um, what is making up the total funding piece of their project. Yeah, are they uh, have engaged a private bank to support them and what that loan structure is, is like? So a lot of times, you know, we have to underwrite it to determine how much debt they can afford to ensure that the project still cash flows. And so um, many times uh, we will look at uh, a combination of a, a grant as well as a low cost loan to, um, to help that project um, cash flows. You know, we don't want to um, have you going into um, a, a project and it does not cash flows. You know, they are low income individuals that we occupy these units, so they're not market rate. So we do look at the entire structure of all the funding that is incorporated uh, that goes into that project. And so, just so everyone's clear, what is the significance of having a grant portion versus a loan portion? 
So a rent portion is generally, uh, you don't pay back. It's set up as a forgivable type format, forgivable loan, so to speak. Some people like to refer to it as a grant. I don't want to utilize the word as a grant because it's set up as a, um, a forgivable loan. A portion is forgiven each year. Um, keep in mind, when you're utilizing these federal dollars, there is an affordability period that you have to commit to as you utilize these dollars. A lot of animals actually go in more details of that um, so that the property remains affordable for a number of, a number of, um, a number of years um, as it required through HUD. But I will let a lot of animals go in details on that. <laughs> Uh, for profits, we do look at those. Uh, again, uh, if you notice that the interest rate that we generally uh, extend to for profit organizations is 3.5 uh, interest rate, uh, which is still excellent when it comes to um, lending. Uh, if you look at the interest rate now on the private market, you know, you're looking at an 8% interest rate uh, at least right now. So, again, we want to ensure that that project cash flows, okay? Uh, so it remains sustainable the entire affordability period. Again, when we extend these types of loans, uh, we, are, we are willing and um, more than willing to take a junior lien to the private lending sector. So if you have a bank loan, you know, they're going to want to be in first lien position, okay? That's a given most times. So we will be willing to take second position. Um, in some cases, we are willing to take third position. Okay, so, but the key is, um, is to make it, make it all work, make it all cash flows so where it makes sense. And again, the project remains sustainable. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we do look at a forgivable loan, um, of course, repayable loan, and a combination of both to ensure the cash flows. Um, once, uh, you know, once your project completed, and we'll allow a 90-day grace period, so to speak, before you start beginning to um, debt service your loan with the city. We do have some flexibility on that as well. Um, sometimes I've seen some six months, I've seen a year that we've done in the past, which means we'll allow you to move forward, uh, occupy those units, uh, collect rent for at least 12 months before you start debt servicing of the city's loan. They give you some flexibility to build up your reserve so that you can maintain those units, okay? So uh, with the home funds uh, that I mentioned, we do look at um, a combination of other funding source. Uh, we are the participation jurisdiction of um, HUD's home funds as well as CBG we use, um, which is uh, community block grant program, which is refer to our CBG, use those dollars as well to provide some rehabilitation also. All right, just look at um, some, some projects that we've been involved in recently uh, with our home dollars. Uh, we work with an organization out of Greenville, Homes of Hope. This is Greenville now. <laughs> Uh, this is just, like I mentioned, the most recent project that we've um, completed. Uh, I think we closed this project um, in 2022. Now, keep in mind, they started back in 2020 uh, working on this project, you know, contacting the city about this opportunity, um, solidifying the land um, that, um, that had been identified. Um, so I want to kind of share with you, this is over the Edisto area. Total, total development cost uh, was 5.3 million that went into the overall cost to complete it. If you notice how much funds that we provide on the city side, home funds, which is 609,000. Got one minute, okay. And so this right here is a multi-family uh, affordable rental unit. Eight units is affordable. Uh, mind you, there's 22 units in the entire project but eight are the affordable ones that we provided assistance with the home dollars. So does that mean some of them are market, market rate? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot of folks 
which is how we used to live, where you know doctors live right next door to teachers and so forth. But this allows mixed income. Mixed income yeah. in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, so another project we have assisted in the past, uh, this is through TN Development Corporation. Harrison, you want to stand up? Harrison is the executive director. Harrison back there in the back with the uh, blue uh, vest. Uh, he's the executive director over TN Development. Um, they were involved in the Watercrest Townhome. Um, if you notice the um, total development cost for that project. Harrison, what, what year was this? That was uh, nine years ago. Nine years ago. Now, the only reason why I ask that question is because if you, if you notice the total development cost that went into this project was $1.1 $1. $1. $1 million. Huge difference. Huge difference now. So uh, those were the good days, so to speak. So if you notice the project timeline it took to complete that project is 3.5 years. Okay, so it does take time uh, to, um, you know, to finalize it. A lot, a lot of work goes into it. This is Harrison contact information here. And we'll send out the PowerPoint and you get a hard copy today. So yes. Yeah. One more, one more, Demon. So this right here is a, a project that was done around the North Main, uh, the veranda. This is a senior community. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful development. Uh, if you know it was a light tech project, total development cost is ten million. And tell everyone, not everyone knows what light tech. Low income housing. Yes, light tech is low income housing tax credit. Those are funding sources you would get from the state from the state government. Um, you have to apply through state housing um, to to um, to have access to those funds. Okay. So it's, um, and I'll give you some information about that too, or who to contact for more information. So, um, two million, uh, seven million came from the um, low income tax credit. Two million came from the bank, and then a million came from um, what did they come from, Bernie? Um, it was a loan to the project. Loan to the project. So Bernie works with uh, the Columbia Empowerment Zone. Stand up, Bernie. Okay. So if you, have, if you need any information about the level that it took to bring that project to um, uh, to close, to, um, to completion, she can provide information on that. Felicia Maloney is the executive uh, director of the Columbia Empowerment Zone. Um, so she was the person that was spearheading that particular project. Do you have another handout? Another handout? We, so we made 25 copies. But I'll email it out. I mean, actually, I'll mail it out to everyone because um, we only had 18. Yeah. We underestimate. I got a little more time. Okay. okay, I think this is my last, um, last slide. So um, I want to kind of give you some funding, other funding sources beyond the city uh, that you all have access to if, if you want to move forward with creating, developing affordable housing units. Uh, this is through the South Carolina Finance and Development Authority. You know, I refer to the SE Housing for short. And these are the various um, programs that they have, funding resources that they have to assist um, that you can apply for. Okay, I'm not gonna mention this, so they know that, you know, that, that they know. And these are the contact persons that you contact. These are the person that, with the expertise <laughs> around these programs here. Kimberly Wilburn, she's over the LIHTC. And then Jennifer Cogan is over the other programs that we have, um, like the Home, the Investment Partnership, SE Housing Trust Fund, Small Real Development, and National Housing Trust Fund. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So Lila, I'm, I'm not going to punish Lila Anna because I did build in a few minutes. So Lila Anna is one of the organizations that receive funding from the city and we want you all to see an example of that. If you could flip forward to 
Okay, and Tony has on his tennis shoes for half minutes. Oh my god. So see that okay. uh, picture. He has on his tennis shoes and I can't run around like he does in the wild so y'all just Um so real quick, we work with at risk, vulnerable, and homeless families with children. Have for almost forty years. Um, Back in 2015, we realized our families had nowhere to go, even if they were working. Um, there was no safe, clean, affordable housing. We went into strategic planning, and we came up with this system of care. Emergency shelter, transitional two-year housing, and affordable housing. Um, the flood happened. At that point, we needed 8,000 units. The flood happened. Within two weeks of us saying we're going to do this, and that number went to about 10,000, and as the mayor said, we're now staring down you know, 16. So we created Live Oak. It is an LLC. Homeless No More is the parent organization, so we are considered a nonprofit developer. We base this on an organization out of New Jersey. At that time, they had about 100 affordable housing units. Um, our latest strategic plan calls for 200 units of housing. We're actually a little over 400 across the state. Um, it also called for us to become senior partners or mentors to other nonprofit developers or organizations. Because with a lot of this funding, you have to have experience to even apply. So if Anything sticks, the three P's, partner, programs, patients. That means our first application, an organization out of Greenville actually wrote, sponsored for us. They served as TA and they were technically funded, kind of like we talk about first lien, second lien. They handed us the keys and signed it over. You've got to do three projects with state housing before they let you apply as a senior partner. So you've got to go find somebody to partner with you who has that experience. Um, right now we have houses scattered throughout the city and Richland County. We, we do new construction. Um, and then we do limited partnerships. So there are for-profit developers who need nonprofits because you have to have some programming component. So we have 300 units that have our name on them where we'll go in and work with the families to make sure they don't face eviction. So this was our first city project back in 2016. And I, to this day, it was funny, I was pulling the paperwork, and Felicia, you were in a lot of the email <laughs> trails. Um, it was Deborah Livingston and Valeria Jackson, city and county. They both had some money, but not enough money. We went to them, and we basically said, we want to do housing. Um, it allowed us to buy four houses. One of them is one block from the first house I owned when I was a newlywed. It was a total of 404,000, and you know, we talk all these acronyms, I call it the ABCs of affordable housing. It was HOME and CDBG, because different funding sources can pay for different things. And we sat down and we figured out how to make it work. Quick question, this is, that was not before it so these two houses were two of the four houses. One's on Harrison Road, one's on Magnum. So the way this worked, we got uh, 202,000 forgivable loan, and what that means is it burns off each year that you remain in compliance. And we're going to kind of touch on that real quick in a minute. No debt service. 202 in home funds from the city at that time. Talk about the good old days. It was 0% interest. So we still make a payment on those two houses, but it was at 0%. Market rate right now is about eight. This is the application. I want y'all to see what you have to have for one of these applications. You have to have 
year to date financials, you have to have a projected monthly cash flow for 10 to 15 years. Because what they want to see is you're not operating in the red. This was for four houses. It's not for the 40 units that we're developing. Tax returns, audited financials, it is a lot. It's usually a four to six inch binder. All right, you have to usually have site control. You have to have your pro forma for 12 to 15 years, your budget. If you're building, you've got to have your high level conceptuals, cost estimates by a licensed contractor. Stage two, you've got to have an environmental, a geotech survey, preliminary architectural. These are the ones that if you're doing 40 units are usually about 145,000. A market study, appraisal if it's for a house that you want to buy, detailed budget. Market, market analysis. Market analysis, you have to, there's a list of people who do this. They are about $3,000. They're the ones who are going to prove there is a need in that neighborhood for what you are doing. So if I said I'm going to build this 3,000 square foot house and I'm going to sell it and it's going to be two doors down from where I live, they're going to look at me and say it's never going to sell. And your funders look at that to see if it's sustainable. <clears throat> Reimbursements for what I just talked about can take up to a year. So you have to have money in the bank to front all of this. You're going to get it back, but it might be a year. Compliance. 15 to 30 years. That means every person who rents from you once a year, you have a file on them, you have to make sure their income matches. It means they're going to come on site and they're going to ping you if the irrigation line is not covered up by pine straw. You take the money, there are strings attached. Restrictive covenant, you can't sell it to somebody else to do something else with it. Um, all funding and this is my 30 seconds, city, county, state, it all comes from HUD. It might just, you know, it's coming through a different place. It's all coming from Washington. So all these rules, Felicia's not making them because she's going to get audited by HUD. So these rules are across the board depending on where you go for what. You're going to have to piece it together like a puzzle. No one person's going to pay for all of it. The best is private because there are no strings attached. There's my contact information. The other one thing that I have to point out is we're a mission-driven organization. We believe in programs versus just housing. Um, as a landlord, and I know Yvonne's going to talk about this, um, you're going to have to evict people. That's counterintuitive for us. So we have a housing coordinator. So when our property manager says we've got a problem, that housing coordinator then goes to the family and says, come on, what's going on? You know you got to pay your rent. We still have to evict people. So you've got to have a program component. You can't just build it and then walk away. Yes. And she did really, really well. I love it. Keep going. Um, thank you, Lila. Um, I have um, I want to I have to move the program around just a little bit because um, of a conflict. Miss Bean has to go, um, but remember earlier I was talking about the, um, the problem that we have with landlords from California, New York, and they don't care about their properties. Um, I was explaining my vision that with the churches um, had these houses. But you got to know how to get them. And this, this would be the Section 8 program. Um, if they wanted to be a part of, and, and you can tell them about your shortage, and if they want to become owners and really help with that program. And you got five minutes. Okay, I appreciate that. And I try to adhere to the rule of five minutes. Um, I do not have a slide presentation. Um, but uh, we do have projects underway that you can drive by today and see um, as they are under construction. 
My name is Yvonne Devine. I am the CEO for Columbia Housing. And um, I want to first commend the city for putting together a meeting of this kind. It, for me, symbolizes the importance of it taking a village to be able to uh, realize the, 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 the realize and meet the need that exists within our own community. Um, we are so super proud to uh, report that we are a part of the solution. We pride ourselves in being a part of the solution, which is why we have uh, projects under construction right now, both at St. Anna's Park. Um, we anticipate uh, being uh, completed by mid next year, as well as Haven and Palmer Point. We're talking about collectively over 400 units of housing that will be added to the city of Columbia's inventory. So that in itself is um, something that we're extremely proud of. The total construction costs for both projects over $100 million. Um, it takes, again, a lot of resources, a lot of different players to be able to realize that level of development. Federal tax credits, state tax credits, um, private capital, uh, you name it. We try not to leave any stone unturned because we recognize the importance of being able to create quality, affordable housing. That's what we represent. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today, but I could not not um, point out um, just the role that we're playing in being a part of the solution. I want to talk today specifically about the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and again, I commend the city for recognizing the importance of having us at the table as well to be a part of this conversation. Um, we, on a monthly basis, inject over $3 million into the local economy through the Housing Choice Voucher Program. We have dollars that we receive specifically from HUD, the federal government, to, to, to pay to private landlords, potentially such as yourselves, um, on a monthly basis on behalf of the families that we serve. So that's $36 million a, a, a year. That's significant. Um, however, uh, the need is grand, right? We have um, right now over 150 vouchers on the street, meaning we have issued 150 vouchers to families that are searching for housing, that are looking for housing and housing is not as easy to come by as it was years ago. Um, affordable housing, that is. And so we need you all, we need investors, we need churches that own homes and properties to partner with our agency to participate in the program and make your units of housing available to those families that we serve. The other piece that we do that um, the community uh, d d doesn't always know is that we also are huge homeownership proponents. Um, we have been participants in the homeownership program for well over 25 years. We have currently 80 families that are in our Housing Choice Voucher Homeownership Program. And what that essentially means is that we have 80 families that have vouchers, the same rental assistance that we pay to you all on behalf of those families for rent. We're paying to mortgage companies on behalf of those families for homeownership which is significant, and most people um, don't know that. And so I wanted to make certain that I shared that little bit of information as well. The other piece, and last piece, I hope I'm, I'm doing great on my time, yes. The, okay, thank you. The other piece is that um, HUD recognizes that housing costs today aren't what housing costs were two years ago. And so one of the things that they have done to assist uh, renters and being able to find a home that's within their price range is they allowed us to increase payment standards. The payment standards are the amounts potentially that a private landlord can get in rent. Um, and I can send Tina some information, um, Councilwoman Herbert, excuse me, some information to have her share with um, you all so you can see this um, in front of you. I'm a visual person, um, but it varies from for the different bedroom sizes. But it used to be that um, we could only uh, issue a payment standard of up to 110% um, of the fair market rents. Well, HUD has issued an exception that allows us to now um, increase our payment standards up to 120% of the fair market rent, which opens up the opportunity for um, housing options for those individuals with the voucher um, a little bit more. It broadens it, it expands it. And you as a landlord 
you want to be able to maximize the amount of rent that you receive for your asset, your property too. That's important. So we've made enough fuss and noise where they did increase it. And so for, for simple folks like me, give an example of, you know, previously you, for a particular situation you would have you can get this amount and you can get that. Yeah, sure. Okay, so for, yeah, I got a, um, on our website, we have our payment standard, you, Tommy, our payment standard information. So I'll just give you an example of um, a one-bedroom unit. So for a one-bedroom unit, previously we could um, go up to 110%, which was 1,036. And now uh, we can go up to 120%, which is 1,243 um, a month. So that's just an example. Now, understand that it depends. It's, it's a case-by-case -case situation. It also depends on the family's um, income, right? Um, it also depends on the cost of utilities. So the amount that I gave you doesn't mean that you'll get that exact amount. Um, because it's in a case-by-case -case situation, but there is a potential to. And so that's important to point out and um, make sure that you all understand as well and hopefully encourage you all to participate in the program. We have a lot of other programs, too, that allow us to work with veterans. We have, um, you know, supports that we are able to provide for individuals seeking housing where we can, in fact, assist with security deposits and some other things. So um, we're definitely actively doing what we can to um, ensure that individuals who need housing have housing. Um, Councilwoman Herbert also asked me to speak to the waiting list. So we have right now um, about 4,000 families on our waiting list. That's 4,000 families in need of housing. That's significant. It's it, it very easily, um, to be uh, perfectly frank with you, when we open the waiting list, it's, it's so easy to, to receive 50, to receive 500 applications in about 15 minutes. So the need is grand, but again, um, we can't do it by ourselves. Certainly we provide housing, but the need exceeds what's in our, within our portfolio, so we need the help and support of all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we really give those materials to you. But one of the things I want to emphasize too, and she um, talked about the village concept, um, people who have Section 8 vouchers, and, and I was on the voucher program back when I had my, my baby, was a little baby. Um, it's important to have stable housing. And my theory, and this is just Tina Herbert, but if you're able to stay even as a renter in a home for five or ten years, you're more likely to have a village. Because at some point, you're going to get to know that neighbor after five or ten years. But if folks are moving every year or every two years, there, of course, I'm not going to say anything to a child and they're paying, they just moved in six months ago. You know what I'm saying? So to me, that also helps us build our village back because we are losing our villages. So thank you for that. Tony Lawton is up next. Tony, you have exactly five minutes. Somebody's going to get four of you. Uh, hopefully it's not me. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out this morning. When uh, Councilwoman Herbert told me that I would be presenting to men and women of the clergy, I said, Lord, I'm ready. I can't cast it ready and I got the shoes on, so I, I, I'm ready to go. So I think uh, the preparation hymn for the day uh, will be uh, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Hey. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it ain't the rhythm of the show, and if you're happy and you know it, clap your hand. See, the first people know that, because before they come up, she does always a hymn. So, uh, again, that's what we are, my five minutes. Uh, cause, so, uh, so, what if uh, Councilman Herbert asked me to talk about the Belmont Revitalization Project? Uh, as the mayor came up, he was talking about uh, the Belmont Project. Basically, the Belmont Project came as a result of the East Central Plan. Uh, and as Ms. Uh, Kilgore talked about the clusters that covered the city of where the city is looking to uh, do development, 
Belmont is one of those areas, and the way we got to Belmont was it had the largest tract of land uh, owned by the TN Development Corporation, so it's a partnership there. We currently have uh, about 25 lots there, and if you look at part of what we're going to do, uh, the community wanted a community park. So part of that uh, land, what we're going to use is going to be to develop a community park that will have walking trails, et cetera, followed by about 15 to 20 houses. Uh, that's what the park will look like. Uh, so we have uh, over there, we're going to, those are some renderings of the houses that uh, will be going over there. You have uh, the Noble, which is a three bedroom, two bath, 1,300 square foot home. The Maple is a three bedroom, two bath, is a 1,200 square foot home. Um, the preliminary pricing for those homes is the Maple is coming in about 151,000. The Noble is about 160. Didn't have the Dorsey because uh, they didn't have the color renderings. To show you the commitment from the city of Columbia, uh, those costs does not include our permits. The city is doing all of the water sewer. They're waiving the permit. Um, and then we are looking at $15,000 in down payment assistance. So if you're looking at, you take about $20,000 uh, away from those numbers. So you're talking about $130,000, uh, $140,000, $150,000 as it relates to the prices for those homes. Uh, in addition to that, the city is going to deed the lot to the potential homeowner, so that cost is not even included in there. So we're talking about individuals that's going to be walking away uh, with significant equity in their homes. Uh, so for the uh, church organizations, things of that nature, I feel like it's very important uh, that you develop what we call a CHO. That's a community development, excuse me, community housing development uh, nonprofit. Um, it's and uh, Saul's talked about that a little bit, and the Spirit Board talked about it a little bit. This is your opportunity to set up this type of organization so that you can then get some of this funding. As Ms. Saul's talked about, uh, you, know, you can't just go run and set that up and think you're going to get that funding. It's the opportunity to partner with organizations such as yourself or other organizations so that you can really empower your parishioners. If you have vacant land, things of that nature, you can then build on that. You can either rent those homes to your parishioners or you can sell them to your parishioners. Keep the money flowing in the community. Tommy, in your last minute, tell us how, how we got this. <laughs> <laughs> tell us how we got this. This is the private sector. And this is the, the private sector. So basically what uh, we're doing is uh, the city has the land, we're putting the infrastructure there. We have a private developer who's going to build those homes. Um, the, they're going to carry the construction perm and we will take them out on the end. Um, so um, that's how that works. Um, funding opportunities, state housing, city of Columbia, Richmond County Community Development, Lexington County. Um, your membership, as it relates to setting up the CDC, uh, you have to have one third, you know, it has to be divided up equally uh, with someone from low income to be on that board. Um, that will give you good funding op options. And, oops, I'm not putting it in, but here's the thing I would like to uh, stay long, but give me five minutes. Um, so thank you guys. I'll uh, be around and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, Pastor Ezell is not here, so I'm going to tell, I kind of told his story. No, 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 I got it. 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 So I'm going to ask Ben to come on up, Ben Johnson. So um, earlier you heard me talk about Pastor Ezell came to me like in 2015, 2016 when I worked at the city. And he had the shopping center. I thought I had a picture of the shopping center, but you all know what I'm talking about, the old shopping center on the corner of River Drive and Sunset. And he wanted to develop it. Um, and he held up to the property. Now, y'all, you see what year it is. It's 2023. And I finally met with him again, uh, eight years later. And he had to make some hard decisions, okay? So essentially, 
um, it was cost prohibitive for him to do the project. And so, without telling pastors business, tell us what you all plan to do in that transaction, high level. Sure, you got four. four. Uh, let's see if I can get it done in three. Oh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Ben Johnson. Um, I'm with Weddell Real Estate Investments and l, l Economic Research, and we are a consultant for Streams Development. Um, they're a multifamily developer out of Greenville, South Carolina, and currently they're working with Pastor Zell um, on the site at 301 Sunset to do a, a market rate, private sector, multifamily development. And so Councilwoman Herbert kind of wanted me to talk about you know, what that involves and some of the costs. Um, and so to do that, we are, our plan is to build 300 apartment units. There's going to be a 520 space parking garage on 46 surface parking units. Um, 120 of those are going to be one bedroom, 152 two bedroom units, and 28 three bedroom units. And the, the total cost to do this, and, and I think one reason why it was kind of out of reach for, for the pastor and the church community, it's going to be a $93 million project. Wow. And so that's, that's broken down. Um, about $78 million of that is going to be just the construction costs. Then you have a number of soft costs to go into the design, the planning, the traffic studies. Uh, there is $800,000 of environmental remediation that has to take place on that site due to a, a film developing company that had an underground storage tank that leaked back in the 70s wow. that has never been remediated. And Pastor didn't know that. Y'all know that, right? right. right. <laughs> yes, he, he purchased the property uh, without that knowledge, unfortunately. Um, wow. and, and another component, you know, with, with the current economic condition, 5.6 million of that is interest costs. And so, you know, a number of the programs that um, the, the city is, is bringing up for uh, housing assistance and all that, that provides us low interest loans for folks that, that that's available to, that really does make a big difference. Um, and, and so, you know, all, all in, we're hoping to get the project off the ground and, and start construction sometime uh, fall of 2024 and have it completed by 2026. Thank you. And so the point of this presentation is you may not be able to, well, you can't do it by yourself. <laughs> okay, you can't do it by yourself. Finding a developer that you can partner with and strike a deal with, I'm not going to get in your business, um, but, you know, make it an equitable deal. Um, but it also tells, we, we have a lot of situations where people buy property and then they find out all these problems. So the remediation, is it 1 million, 1.2 million? 800 of, of remediation on the environmental and then removal. There's also 1,500 tires that have been dumped on the site. Oh, that so also, what's the total number? That'll be about 1.2 total, yes ma'am. Yeah, so before he could do anything, he realized he had to come up with a 1.2 million dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, that's a great way to start a project, isn't it? All right, so if we could go to Mr. Huggins' video and you'll walk up while the video is playing, because we are about done and you're going to finish at in five minutes. <laughs> and I'm, 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 I'm serious. We're going to be done with the program. <laughs> Uh, when there was an opportunity to put a roof on someone's house, and I was more than happy and wanted to jump on that. So I um, enjoyed what I got to do, and being able to use my hands, and able to work in the community, and be able to, be able to bless homeowners that uh, were in need. Uh, I definitely saw the opportunity and wanted to just be a part of it. I enjoyed it, and thankful that I got to do it. Starting to get a pretty good idea of what you're going into. You're not um, going blind and misunderstanding what the word's going to be. Uh, we came in, we worked on her roof the day that I was here. We worked on her soffit and her face We did repairs underneath in the deep wall, up in the roof, and uh, we were able to get that square away and seal it off and waterproof and all that good stuff so she wouldn't have to worry about it. Well, me and my friends talked about maybe signing up together. And we just signed up online, and we were in the same group, so we all worked on the same house and site together. So I was looking forward to trying.
trying some new skills and learning how to do some things to work at crosses. I think uh, homeworks is a really great way to connect like younger people with the older people that we don't really interact with on a daily basis, and we can just see how, like, even though we may not even know them, we can help out and we can serve a purpose in their life that really means a lot to them. I was married for about 27 years before I got divorced. And then I moved in my own apartment on Broadway Road. And after that, I moved in a few other places. And my father passed away. And I moved up here on Page Street with my mom. I moved in this side, and my mom was on this side. Level of one, and I was level of one and a half. So I stayed with her until she got, she ended up passing away with Alzheimer's and heart trouble. So once she moved, once she moved in the nursing home, and I still stay here. So then I had the whole house to myself. So after that, then the house of course needed some work. So when I talked to my brother and my sister and different family members, but of course nobody could help because nobody had that kind of money. Because my parents took care of this house when they was alive, my mom and my dad. But once I moved in, I didn't have the finances to do all the stuff that needed to be done. So I had three leaks. I got one leak fixed, and then the other two leaks didn't get fixed until I, until homeworks got here. And then I had some, um, what you call the things up on the roof, shingles. I had some shingles left over and ended up using my shingles. And they fixed the whole thing where I had leaks and where leaks was beginning to start. Then I didn't know about it. I didn't know about So they fixed that. So I only found out about homeworks when uh, one of my insurance, insurance people who got me into insurance, they called and told homeworks about me. And I was so grateful because I'd done everything else I could do and I couldn't get no help. So I was so grateful for homeworks. Uh, good morning, it's an honor to be here with you, and thank you, uh, Ms. Herbert, for putting this together. I am Joe Huggins with Homeworks of America, and if it doesn't uh, come up, we're just going to go. Um, we provide free home repairs for elderly, disabled, and veteran homeowners who qualify for our program. Home ownership, low income, very low income. And we do that through the vision of four pillars, the first one being affordable housing. At Homeworks, we believe that the cheapest house is the one that's never built. HomeWorks um, takes advantage of the well-stocked um, inventory we have in Columbia here at the post-World War II boom. We have houses here with good bones, but they need roofs, they need soffit, they need fascia. And if we can replace those wood items that rot over time, we can extend the life of these homes for seven and a half, 10 to 15 to 20 years, okay? We also look at the health environment of the home. 40% of your personal health is dictated by where you live the air you breathe, the things you trip over, okay? And if we can take a look at, at your home of what's making you sick or sending you to the hospital, and we can remedy that, okay? We can keep you out of the hospital and keep in your, you in your home to age in place gracefully. The next thing we saw that in the video is workforce development. If we can get the new next generation off their phones <laughs> and in the community working with tools, but most importantly, colliding with that demographic that they hardly never see, and that's the elderly um, generation of our, of our city. 
Okay, that's going to make a difference. And then the fourth thing that we're, the fourth thing that we are passionate about is the gospel. Okay, because our job is to get the roof on, but our passion is the gospel. Because if we can go into a home and share the love of Jesus with homeowners, it starts in that home and it goes next door. And it goes across the street. And then it's in the neighborhood. And then it's in our city. Because I'm called to change the heart of our city if, I, if I'm doing what I profess to believe. So what do we need from our churches is we need volunteers. Mm -hmm. We need volunteers to go into these homes because we're going to get the work done. But I need you to go in and sit on that couch. We're done in a day. Our work is done in a day. Okay? And so what does it look like for the local church to go into these homes weeks and months and years after I'm gone? And we take a Thanksgiving meal and a Christmas dinner and a Christmas present. That changes hearts. Oh, by the way, my typical home costs are five to seventy-five hundred dollars. Okay, so with mission dollars. We can extend the life of these homes for 5, 10, 15 years. And in the city of Columbia, we have done 200 homes since 2017 with a return on investment of nearly $2 million. Wow. So we would invite you to come partner with us, and I would look forward to talking with you. Thank you, Ms. Tina. We love you. Tuesday. Tuesday. No, I think we met Thursday of last week. I was like, oh, I got to put you on the program. <laughs>